Hi, this is Negan Zehauer from SM Juror, and today we're going to be looking at the juror misconduct issues in the case of Granada Ruiz versus the 8th Judicial District Court of the State of Nevada, which is a Nevada Supreme Court case. Here we're going to look at two topics. First, juror misconduct stemming from a juror's internet legal research on the terms premeditation and self-defense. And second, the trial court's sua sponte declaration of a mistrial due to manifest necessity and its ramifications on whether double jeopardy bars the new trial. Now, in this murder and battery case, on a weekend recess during deliberations, Juror 3 did internet research on the terms premeditation and self-defense and shared this information at length with the jury when they resumed deliberations. Two jurors sent notes to the trial court informing it of what had happened, and the trial court interviewed Juror 3 and the foreperson. The foreperson stated that the research was discussed at length and that they were currently at a vote of 11 to 1 not guilty. Juror 3 described what he learned and said he did the legal research because he was confused by some things the prosecutor said during closing arguments and he wanted to clarify. The trial court found that Juror 3 had a fundamental misunderstanding of his duty uh, to sit as a juror. Additionally, the jury had not returned the statements of law which were included in the jury instructions. The trial court on three occasions asked the parties for their thoughts and opinions relative to declaring a mistrial and gave them the opportunity to present their positions on how to handle the juror misconduct and provide supporting case law. No party objected to the mistrial at any time. The trial court also considered whether it should excuse juror three and replace him with an alternate, but indicated that that would not solve the issue because the research was already discussed at length. After its investigation, the trial court sua sponte and with no objection from the parties declared a mistrial, finding that a mistrial was manifestly necessary since the effect of the discussion of the internet research could not be undone. The defendant then moved for dismissal of all charges, indicating that a re-prosecution of the case was barred under double jeopardy principles. That motion was denied and the defendant appealed. The Supreme Court found that although the defendant did not expressly consent to the declaration of a mistrial, he impliedly consented to it based on the totality of the circumstances. First, when the issue of the internet research was first discovered, defense counsel agreed with the court's initial impression that the internet research permeated the deliber deliberations and concerned central issues at trial. Second, no party objected to the idea of declaring a mistrial at any time. And finally, third, the district court solicited the positions of the parties on three separate occasions relative to declaring a mistrial or moving for a less drastic memory, and no one provided any alternative or objection. Also, with respect to the trial courts declaring a mistrial sua sponte due to manifest necessity, the Supreme Court found that a manifest necessity did exist. First, the juror misconduct on the internet research involved legal definitions and issues which were material to the case. The information came to the trial court through two juror notes, which indicated that juror three was unwilling to follow the law as provided in the jury instructions. Second, in order to see if the research tainted the deliberations, the trial court interviewed the foreperson and juror three and discovered that the research was discussed at length. Third, the jury did not return the jury instructions from deliberations, which contained the correct statements of law. Fourth, a less drastic remedy was considered and then rejected. That was the idea of excusing juror three and replacing him with an alternate. Also, the district court on three occasions asked the party to present arguments on the appropriateness of declaring a mistrial and their positions on a different remedy. Neither party offered a different remedy or objected to the declaration of a mistrial. Also, defense counsel agreed that the legal research had permeated the deliberations. And as we know from earlier, with no objection to the declaration of a mistrial, 
the defendant impliedly consented to it, so double jeopardy does not bar the retrial of his case. Now, even though the court has the power to declare a mistrial sua sponte, the parties must still object to it to preserve their position on the record. A sua sponte declaration of mistrial does not bar a re-prosecution of the same charges when there is a manifest necessity to declare a mistrial, as there was here. This concludes our analysis of the juror misconduct issues in this case. For more information about other juror misconduct cases, our CLE courses, and other updates, please click on the red button. And remember, don't let juror misconduct taint your next verdict. I'm Negan Zayhauer from SM Juror. Thanks for watching and see you next time.